Hey everybody, this is Tim Chavez from Faith Matters. For today's episode, we're sharing one more talk with you from our Restore Gathering in 2022. This was one of our absolute favorite sessions, and it was the final presentation right at the end of Saturday afternoon. We were privileged to hear from Brian McLaren, who shared his simple and incredibly resonant framework for faith development. It's one that we've referenced before on this podcast, and we think that you'll love hearing Brian teach it. Brian does a beautiful job emphasizing that the point isn't to get everyone to a particular stage of faith. Rather, it's creating a church and a community where each stage is welcome and included. First, you'll hear Brian give his presentation, and afterward, Aubrey and I sit down for a live Q&A with him. We think Brian brought really key insights to both parts of this session. When we listened back, there was so much there that we hadn't fully absorbed. And even if you were with us at Restore last year, we really think this one's worth a listen. For those of you who haven't heard from Brian before, he's a best-selling author, speaker, and public theologian. A former college English teacher and pastor, he's a passionate advocate for a Christianity that is just, generous, and works with people of all faiths for the common good. He's a core faculty member of The Living School and podcaster with Learning How to See, which are both part of the Center for Action and Contemplation. His newest books are Faith After Doubt, released in 2021, and Do I Stay Christian, which was released in 2022. Thanks so much, as always, for listening. And with that, we'll jump right into Brian's presentation. I'm happy to be with you for this, uh, for this session. Uh, any of us who grow up in families with a religious conviction that is very, very strong, we get a whole set of benefits that are really, really deep. Um, but we also find out that there are certain strings attached to those benefits. And when we begin to struggle with our faith, um, uh, when we experience what uh, our brother earlier said was we, a sort of a fall from innocence, uh, we, we find the cost can be pretty high. Um, so I'd grown up in that kind of very high commitment uh, religious setting. Uh, I uh, developed a love for literature when I was in high school, and I became an English major, and I went to uh, uh, university and studied all kinds of literature, and I wanted to be a professor, so I went to graduate school, and uh, I would, had a teaching fellowship, so I would be studying, and then they paid me a little money to teach and paid my tuition. It was a good deal for a guy who's cheap, and uh, for a guy who's cheap, they sent a little memo out and they said, look, most college professors have never taken an education course. <laughs> and it shows uh, with some. But they said, um, we're, we're offering free one-day seminars on different aspects of education for our young faculty. So uh, there's this day-long seminar. And all I saw is the word free. And I thought that'd be a good thing. So I went, and it was a presentation on adolescent intellectual development, since most college students are between the ages of 18 and 22, or they were back then. The age has gone up a lot more now. Um, they, they said it would be helpful for you to understand how young adults learn. So I went and thought this will help me be a better teacher. And the, the woman who is presenting uh, I'll just, I can picture her, I can picture her tone of voice, I can picture, I can remember her corny jokes, I remember everything about the day, because I thought I went there for myself as an English teacher, but once I was about 20 minutes in, I felt like she was helping me understand my religious life. Because when she talked about adolescent intellectual development, it translated perfectly to the struggles that I was going through, only a few years older than these students in my mid, now I was uh, 24, 25, 26, somewhere in there. Uh, and I just thought this, I, I felt almost ecstatic by the end of the day. Uh, and um, what came out of that is, I learned about a particular theorist named William Perry, whose specialty is adolescent intellectual development. But I'd known there were other theorists of human development. Going back to, many of you would know the name Soren Kierkegaard. Way back in the early 1800s, he had a theory of stages of development. And 
Um, the great British romantic poet William Blake had had a kind of a stage theory. And if you're familiar with Freud and Piaget, they all had stage theories. And, and I found out that there was someone named Fowler, who was a, a guy who wrote about stages of faith development. And then there was another guy named Kohlberg. And then there was a group of feminists who'd critiqued the whole first wave of, uh, of stage theorists because they were all men, tended to be white men, who tended to study white men to learn about stages of, uh, of uh, development. And so they started saying, well, let's look at how women develop. And then there's been this whole field in the last 40 or 50 years about racial identity development. What's it like to grow up African-American in a predominantly Anglo-American setting? How do you become aware of your racial identity? What's it like to grow up Puerto Rican-American or Native American? Or, and, and this is happening around the world. Studies in identity development are just huge. Uh, and so over the years, I ended up, I taught English for a while, then I became a pastor for 24 years. And I started trying to teach some of this to people in my congregation. And the first thing I wanted to do is get away from the metaphor or get away from the image of like I'm in stage one and then I graduate to stage two and then I graduate to stage three. I didn't want to have a hierarchy, an ascending scale, because it just felt like any time you create a hierarchy, it gives you, like uh, was said this morning, how people who are in, in, in innocence look down on the fall and people who are in the fall look back on people who are in innocence. We always want to use any tool to look down on people. So what seemed more helpful for me is to use the metaphor of a tree. So I don't know if you've ever thought of it this way before, but trees grow taller by growing fatter. Um, at some point in my life, I stopped growing taller, <laughs> but I've kept growing. But you know, at the tip of a branch, the new growth comes out. And the way this shows when you do a cross section of a tree is what is the green growth at a tip of the branch is this flush of new development that's happening all over the tree, a new layer. So each, you start with a tree that just has one little ring and then a new ring grows out from that, and a new ring grows out from that. The new ring does not replace the old ring. It depends on the old ring. It builds on the old ring. Um, it includes it and transcends it. It includes it and grows beyond it. Does that make sense? Um, and so that's the metaphor that I'm going to use. And it's a very simple little framework. Uh, I you will remember it, even if you try not to, you won't be able to help remembering it. Simplicity, complexity, perplexity, harmony. It's in some ways that image this morning of creation, fall, um, uh, atonement, um, it's a little bit, you, you could fit it into that. Again, I, I'm trying to get away from a linear image, but if you were to say that that creation is a little bit like simplicity, um, and then you begin to slide out of the simplicity into complexity, and the complexity gets even more severe, and it comes into perplexity, and the perplexity moves you toward harmony, um, and harmony or solidarity is, uh, if you think of that word atonement, a lot of people think of it as sort of a legal word, meaning, uh, you know, having to do with you're in, a, in big trouble and you get out of trouble or something like that. But if you think of atonement as oneness, at one meant coming into connection, and it, that's what happens with that biggest circle. And I'm going to complexify this in just a couple minutes. But what I'd like to do is just quickly explain these four stages to you. See if they're useful. This is just a tool. It's not that you're supposed to fit into this. I'm just trying to use it to help explain some of what's happened to me and to a whole lot of us. And it might be useful for you. Um, simplicity is, is the stage of dualism. It's where we all begin as children. 
You, you find out if you can learn to ride a bicycle, your parents clap and smile when you're on the sidewalk. But when you veer down into the street, they yell at you. You learn, oh, sidewalk, good. Street, bad, right. So the world is divided into good and bad, us and them. People who are like us, people who are strangers. Us, them, in, out. Uh, safe, dangerous, familiar, unfamiliar. And this is the work of stage one. Uh, a lot of people stay in stage one their whole lives. Uh, nothing ever disrupts them from it. Um, and in this stage, we are dependent on authority figures who tell us what the rules are. In who's in, who's out, what's right, what's wrong, what's clean, what's dirty, what's safe, what's dangerous, what's acceptable, what's condemned. So we're dependent upon authority figures. And those authority figures give us easy answers. And we believe in this stage that everything is either known or knowable. And in a certain sense, life is a war because it's the good guys versus the bad guys, the right authorities versus the wrong authorities, and life is very, very simple. And um, when you learn Christianity, when you learn Mormonism, uh, when you learn to be a Roman Catholic, when you learn to be Pentecostal, when you learn to be Buddhist or Jewish or Hindu, in a certain sense, ev almost everybody starts at stage one, um, and there's this sense that we're the good guys and those other people are a little bit dangerous. Um, uh, and that's why this sort of warfare mentality uh, spreads. Um, and in simplicity, I'm looking for meaning in belonging to the in-group and belonging to the group who has it right. And uh, as I say, a lot of people stay there their whole lives. Um, I'll, something happens to some of us and we're kicked out of simplicity. Uh, sometimes it happens when you become a teenager and you um, get a crush on somebody from another religion. And your parents are worried and you get to know this other person's family and they're really nice people. And you think, hold it, I thought we were the nice people and they're the bad people, and they turn out to be kind of nicer than some of our people. And you think, oh gosh, this, and they must just be hiding their, you know. Um, but now I've got to figure out how to patch up my simple world. And I say that this stage is pragmatic because uh, now my job is either to explain away the things that don't fit into my simplicity or to find a way to add some fine print to the simplicity contract. To say, well, there are a few exceptions. Um, sometimes what drives you out of simplicity into complexity is education. You are taught in elementary school, maybe high school, things that don't conflict with what you're taught in church, but then you go to college and suddenly you're taught things that don't match and you don't know how to put it to together. Uh, sometimes it's because of travel. Um, I, I think many different religions have missionary experiences and the way missions are supposed to work is that you go to convert people in some other place, but sometimes you go to the other place and those people you think, I think they might be better off than and, and it messes up your thinking. Sometimes it's through reading. You start reading people with different experiences. In one way or another, you're shoved out of the nest of simplicity and you now have to start thinking for yourself. For me, this began, as I mentioned uh, earlier, with science. And when I became interested in evolution and my Sunday school teacher told me, you can either believe in God or evolution, I remember thinking, four or five years, I'm out of here. And then I thought, between now and then, I'm going to keep my mouth shut. And what I meant by that was not that I was going to be a hypocrite. It was just that I knew I wasn't going to win any arguments uh, in, this, in this context. So I kept my private thoughts to myself. I gave myself permission 
behind my smiling face to have some of my own thoughts. And so there's an independence that develops. I stopped looking for authority figures to give me easy answers, and I started looking for mentors and coaches who would tell me how to succeed, who would give me ideas and how to learn and think for myself. I looked for conferences and other retreats and other kinds of places where I could meet some people who would teach me in a different way and weren't going to threaten me if I didn't agree with them. I was really looking for people who I could ask questions of and maybe even challenge uh, because I needed to learn to think for myself. I was looking for simple steps and techniques and I still cherish this thought, not that all is known or knowable, but anything can be fixed and any problem can be solved. And life is a set of winnable games. And now I'm looking for meaning in individual and in-group achievement and in being independent. A lot of people stay in complexity their whole lives. I think that the United States has been a stage two complexity culture for a long time, although I think we're reverting right now back into stage one simplicity. Because of the influence of religious people in simplicity and because um, people in simplicity are very susceptible to authoritarian con artists who know how to manipulate them by making them feel good and making some other people, group of people be the evil ones upon whom we vent all of our fear. So the United States has, you know, does well in stage one and stage two. Stage three, people, you know you're slipping into stage three. See, in stages one and two, you learn how to critique all the out groups, everybody who's different from you. But when you begin to critique your in-group, that tends to be a sign that you're moving into stage three. And you say, you know, we have these rules, but they have their rules and they think they're right, and they have their rules and they think they're right, and I think that maybe we're not as right as we think we are. And I'm right about that. <laughs> I think I'm right. But I could be wrong, because in, st in stage three, you're suddenly aware that the people who are sure they're right are some of the dangerous people. So you then not only become skeptical of other people, but you also become skeptical of yourself. Um, you might uh, find sign, you, you might feel that you're sort of looking for something that can give you some level of clarity science maybe, some, someone who's a rebel, or somebody who isn't afraid to challenge sacred cows. Um, and, and questions and suspicion bring you on, and you feel that all is subjective and deconstructible, and life is a protest of these hypocrisies and, and oversimplifications. And I'm trying to find truth and honesty and and at least the amount of humility necessary to admit that I don't know everything. And this, for some people, is a stage when things like solitude and contemplation and spiritual direction become very, very important for reasons we can go into uh, during the question and answer section if you'd like. Um, so now in perplexity, I find meaning not in the group I used to belong to, but in the presence of a group of similarly alienated people. Um, because I'm looking for people who give me space to think and be different and wonder and have questions. It might be that, <laughs> it might be that one professor at the university who you know is safe to talk about, or it might be that podcast. I think podcasts are places where people find space to hear, to, in a sense, eavesdrop on conversations that their authority figures wouldn't normally allow. Um, and, and maybe even certain gatherings become places for people in stage three to find each other who are seeking honesty and justice. And a lot of people get to stage three and they stay there their whole lives, often because they've never met anybody in stage four. Now again, I'm not talking about these as hierarchies, but here's the thing. If you stay in stage three long enough, one of two things happens. You either get very comfortable in being the only person who sees through everybody else's hypocrisy, 
Or you say, I'm becoming cynical about my own cynicism and suspicious of my own suspicion and critical of my own critical thinking. I'm making myself sick. <laughs> where do I go from here? This is miserable. I don't like where I am. I can't go back, but I don't like where I am. And many people, they spend enough time there and they start wondering, is there something beyond? And, and very often, you meet somebody and you just think, they get something I don't get. Or you read a book and you think, that writer gets something I don't get. Or you visit somebody and they're at a place you've never, they, they just seem to be able to do things you didn't know how to do. And stage four, I would call integral, uh, non-dual. It's the ability for people to say, yeah, there's right and there's wrong, but the right people have some wrong and the wrong people have some right and, um, and everybody seems to think they're right even when they're wrong. Um, and you learn to be interdependent rather than dependent or independent or counterdependent. And now you're looking for a sage or a prophet or a mystic or somebody who has that has a set of skills of holding reality and all of its mystery and complexity together. And, and you look for a way to be engaged, but to be engaged thoughtfully rather than just in a superficial way. And, you, and, and the deep insight at this stage is you start to feel and see in ways you couldn't see before how everything is connected and, and that things are knowable and simultaneously unknowable. And as one friend of mine said it, a megachurch pastor who went through this deep uh, process, uh, he said, I've, where I am now is all I know is that life is a gift and love is the point. And we find meaning in universal love and connection. Let me just say, uh, before I, uh, we invite uh, Tim and Audrey up here for some conversation, I think if you live long enough, stage four becomes your new simplicity. And here's the bad news. If you live in that new simplicity, guess what's next? New complexity. And you live in that new complexity, guess what's next? New perplexity. And then new harmony. And that process, I think, probably repeats itself a few times. And eventually, I think, you maybe get to the place where you realize that the skills of simplicity, complexity, perplexity, and harmony together are the skills of what it means uh, to be human. So you might want to think about this for you. How does this re relate to you? It might help you understand your parents and your grandparents. It might help you understand your congregation for your religious community and for religious communities in general. Um, and I'll just say something we need in this world uh, and I've devoted you know, a huge part of my life to this project. And I, I just have to tell you, so far, this project is making very slow pro progress. Uh, and sometimes I think we're losing ground. I, we're not losing ground in some ways, but in some ways we are. We need what I would call four-stage faith communities, meaning communities that accept people in simplicity and accept people in complexity, and accept people in perplexity, and accept people in harmony. They accept people wherever they are, but they're led by people in harmony who know how to help the people in simplicity do the work of simplicity, and when they're ready, move to complexity, and so on. Does that make sense? We need communities that create that kind of space. And I believe they're possible, and I believe that many people are creating them on the edges of a lot of our institutions. And I dare to hope that someday our institutions will be able to be these kinds of communities. So that's the big idea from uh, Faith After Doubt. Let's bring up Tim and Aubrey. We'll have some chance to talk. Okay. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, I'll just say, first of all, truly, sincere, sincerely, thank you for the work that you've been doing for decades now. Um, it's, 
we were only introduced to it a couple of years ago, but it's been a hugely powerful part of uh, the reason we're doing this, the reason we're still doing this. I remember uh, when we were lucky enough to meet up with you in, in New York City a year ago, you, uh, you took us aside. I think you saw us as like, oh, those are my, those are my Latter-day Saint friends. They need, they need some help. And we did. That's it's definitely true. And, uh, and, you just, and you just talked to us for a while. And honestly, that gave, that gave me energy to keep going. So thank you for everything you've Thanks. done, Brian. Thanks. We need... We really did. I think we've, we've been hungry for this nourishment and we're really grateful. I want to I wanna ask you, I think that the perplexity, the severe perplexity is the stage where people have so much pain and so much fear and it just feels untenable. It just feels like you just cannot do yeah. it. And so I, I think that the wrestle that we hear about a lot and that, I, that resonates with me and that I've experienced is this, this constant... Um, worry that like you're doing it wrong like do you, should you lean into the doubt yeah. or do you hang on as tight as you can to what you have yeah well here's the thing something inside of us tells us hang on as tight as you can and something inside of us tells us lean into the doubt and i think that's what we do we 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 do both and we find out that in the holding on to both Here's, here's what happens. Remember how I said that stage four is non-dual, meaning it's not either hang on to everything you have or throw it all away and embrace doubt, right? It's the ability to hang on to both is the skill that you need to be in stage four. Does that make sense to everybody? And, and so that, the way you describe that dilemma is exactly, it's not a problem that you can solve. It's a problem that as you wrestle with it, you change, you develop a new capacity. I hope that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Can I ask you, Brian, what about, I mean, and Jared Halverson talked about this a little bit this morning, but there are different levels of doubt, like different people deconstruct, to use a term that hopefully is okay, uh, at two, two different levels. I want to I wanna ask you specifically for, for our friends that have felt that they've deconstructed all the way. They've gone through sort of their surface level beliefs. Yeah. Um, I, I think Jared, in our tradition, the way that he put it was uh, specific beliefs, restoration, Jesus Christ, God. Yes. Um, can we talk to the people that have deconstructed all yeah. the way down? Yeah. And that I've been there. Yeah. Um, it's a scary feeling to feel yeah. like all of a sudden I have an expl I have an intellectual explanation for everything I've ever felt. Yes. Like there's. There's no reason for me to believe anymore, and yes. that connection that I once felt so powerfully to God seems like it's completely gone. Yes. Can you can you talk to anybody in this room that's feeling that way? Yeah. Um, so first, Tim, you just gave a phenomenal gift to people to say it's okay if you're there, and of course, Jared did that so beautifully this morning too. It was such a, a beautiful spirit. Um, so, uh, can, can I have permission to speak very freely, like? You don't have to agree with what I'm about to say, okay? But I'm going to tell you what, I, uh, what I, I believe. I believe God is one of the most beautiful and dangerous words in any language. Beautiful because we project into that word everything that is good and beautiful and just. Dangerous because that word also has within it the, the weapons that we use to harm and damage other people and ourselves. So, like, part of the thing I think we can... And look, even if you don't think that's true of your concept of God, I bet you know some other people whose, con whose word God and concept of God has super, super dangerous elements. Um, I, I, just a quick anecdote on this. S several years ago, I... I'd written a book called Why Did Jesus, Moses, the Buddha, and Muhammad Cross the Road? It's a book about uh, Christian identity in a multi-faith world. And uh, as I was writing that book, I, I was, I, I'd gotten deeply involved with a lot of different multi-faith groups, and I was invited to a, a conference that was almost all Muslims. I was the, one of the very few non-Muslims at the conference. 
And a woman gave a lecture, PhD, a Muslim woman. It was just an absolutely brilliant lecture. And I went up afterwards and I had a bunch of questions. And she was super, she was such a great educator. Like I came with these really complicated questions I couldn't get answers for about Islam. And she gave me these incredibly insightful answers. And we exchanged emails afterward. And I thought, you know, I was just so grateful. But three weeks later, I get an email from her. Yeah, it's, uh, it's one of the most meaningful emails I've ever gotten in my life. But she said, Dear Brian, uh, when I met you at that conference, I'd never heard of you. I didn't know you were a writer. Um, I, I Googled your name, as I often do, with the names of our prophet and of my faith. So she Googled Brian McLaren, Mohammed Islam. She said, I wanted to find out everything you've ever said about my prophet and my faith. And I found out that you have never spoken ill of my prophet or my faith. And that, in fact, you've talked about equality and human rights and dignity and respect for people like me. She said, and then I read, when I searched on those words, I found out that many of your fellow Christians have attacked you and said that you aren't even a Christian because you speak well of people like me and of my faith. And she said, I want to thank you. I'll, I'll never forget. Uh, again, this was closer, remember, in the couple years after September 11, 2001. Some of you are too young to remember this, but some of you remember. There was this anti-Muslim sentiment that was really strong. Now, bigots have moved on to other targets to hate. Um, but Muslims were really the target. And she said, does anyone have any doubt that the next time the smoke of human bodies goes up chimneys somewhere, you understand she's evoking genocide and the Holocaust. Does anyone have any doubt that the next time the smoke of Muslim, of human bodies goes up a chimney, it will be Muslims who are being killed? She said, so thank you for speaking up for my people. She said, you, are saving Muslim lives. You are a true Christian. What was so moving to me, she didn't like lift me up to her level, say you're a Muslim. She let me be who I am, right? But she, and in a certain sense, she said, I know some of your fellow Christians don't think too highly of you, but this Muslim thinks you're all right, you know? And it was this beautiful exchange. Well, the reason I, I say this is, the word God could lead to a lot of people dying in the next 20 or 30 or 50 years, and a lot of people suffering. You can bet that the people who drop an atomic bomb on some other people, if that happens, please God, don't let it happen, but if it happens, the people who do it will praise God that they were given that weapon, and they will think they're doing God's will when they do it. If people need to scrutinize the word God, I would say, for God's sake, do it. <laughs> for God's sake, do it. Because the word and the ideas and the concepts that are there, if, if God, can I say it this way? If, if the word God is salvageable, it has to be scrutinized. It needs some stage three scrutiny for it to be salvaged. So what I would say is I'm less worried about people going all the way to the bottom and asking the deepest questions than I am not enough people going all the way to the bottom and asking the deepest questions. Thank you. I want to I want to ask you we've talked a lot about leadership and our how we how we do community and so I want to talk for a minute about what you do when you're feeling, when, when something that feels like that is coming from a leader who has explicit authority over this community, how can you bring this stage four harmony spirit to the table okay. without being divisive? Okay, so I guess- And how, and how have you done it for so long? Yeah. You've been doing it longer than any of us. Well, you're, you're assuming I'm doing it. Uh, <laughs> I I'm, I'm, I'm continue to struggle with it, right? I don't think the struggle ever ends. And here's why, uh, and this is why your question 
it touches me deeply right now because here's the first thing. So the first thing I'd say is you can't deny the anger. You have to give yourself permission to feel the anger. But here's the other piece. I have to also acknowledge that part of my anger is just angry that the world isn't the way I want it to be. And I want everything to be easy, and this is another problem I've got to grapple with. And he's just getting in my way, you know, and making my life more difficult. Uh, and part of this is, it's just inconvenient to not have everybody be as easy to get along with as I am. <laughs> All those impatient people. So part of this then becomes my challenge, right? To say, oh, this isn't just about him, this is about me. My, my dear friend and colleague Richard Rohr says that contemplation, uh, that contemplation is being open to all of the reality we can stand, um, which is a pretty good definition. And part of what's happening at that moment when I listen to that guy is I'm seeing some reality that I don't want to have to stand. Does that make sense? Like, I just wish that weren't there. And so a huge part of what my personal discipline is right now is just saying, oh, that's there, that's there. And, uh, and there's a hundred ways I can respond to it uh, that will make it worse, but I'm pretty sure to make it better, the first step is to say, that's there. I don't know if that makes yeah. sense, but that's where I am right yeah, now. Yeah, thank you. Okay, final question for you, Brian. And we're closing out these two amazing days right now and thinking about, thinking what we, about what we want to take home with us. And you blew our minds just now. We had a question written out that said, what does stage four community look like? Mm -hmm. And then we realized we got the question wrong. And how, the other question was actually, how do we take stage four community home with us? Mm -hmm. And we realized what we need to ask is how do we take four stage acceptance yeah. home with us? Can you, can you take us home? Yeah, sure. So when I, I have four amazing adult children between the ages of 36 and 42, and um, five amazing grandchildren and all that. So, uh, but when my children were young, I was in stage two, dipping into stage three, running back to stage two, going into stage three, scurrying back to stage two, going into stage three. Um, so, uh, and then when they got to be teenagers, I was just dipping into stage four. And um, so one of the things I have to do is, I, I'm gonna bring up parents and then get to your bigger question, but all of us who are parents, one of the things we have to do well, let me say it this way. One of the things I've had to do with, when each of my children was at a certain place as adults is I've had to say to them, as your dad, I, did the, I loved you so much, and I still love you so much, but I did my very best for you that I possibly could do as a dad, and you deserved so much better. I'm sorry. I wish I could have done better. I did the best I could. And that's the most honest thing I can say to them, you know. And I've had to apologize to them for certain things. I've had to say to them, remember how I disciplined you. I did that because I thought it's what God wanted me to do. Because of the vision I had of God, that's the way God treats people. So I was trying to, to imitate my understanding of God. Now my understanding of God has really changed and I feel what I was really doing is just pulling a power play on you. And I was using shame to manipulate you. And I was afraid for my own reputation if you didn't turn out the way I wanted to. So I was disciplining you in part because I wanted to look good in front of my peers. And I'm so ashamed of those things and I'm so disappointed in myself and I'm sad that you had to suffer from that. I wish I could have done better then, I just didn't know. And of course, when I say that to my two children who have kids, they say, please, Dad, you don't need to apologize. We're making all the same mistakes, you know. 
we feel how hard it is now. We had no idea how hard it is. But the reason I say all that about parenting is when, when you're a parent, you want your kids to grow. You don't, and um, uh, Jared was saying, er, uh, yeah, Jared, was, yeah. uh, was saying earlier today how you, know, you raise your children when they're somewhat compliant and then they become teenagers and all hopes of that are gone. You know? But in a certain sense, all of us who are good parents realize you know, that's part of the job of being a teenager, self-differentiation and responsibility. And either we want to infantilize our children forever or we actually want them to grow up. And so the reason I bring all this up about parents and family is when you love your children, you want them to grow. And the kinds of four-stage communities we need, they can't... They, we need more stage four leaders so that they can be at a place where they can understand and remember people at each stage, but make room for each person to grow. Now, here's where it becomes tricky. And here's where, you know, these are problems. I don't know how to work these out in an in individual context. But sometimes our theological systems are stage one systems or stage two systems. Um, Almost every tradition, sooner or later, develops a stage three element to it and a stage four element to it. Um, it takes time. And there are periods when traditions don't have a stage three or stage four element. They purge them whenever they come along. Um, but eventually, if the, they, they, most traditions get it. You have it in the Bible. Stage one is law and the book of Proverbs. Everything is simple. Wise people do fine. Foolish people mess up. What do they do when foolish people become presidents or CEOs? You know, um, that's when stage two comes in, you know. And then you've got the more complex stuff of the prophets and the wisdom literature. And then comes stage three. You've got that in the book of Ecclesiastes and the book of Job. When a good person, everything goes wrong in his life. What do you do then? And all the people come with their stage one and stage two wisdom, and God intervenes and says to, to, to Job at the end, your friends here, none of them has spoken a word of truth about me. You're the only one who's spoken truthfully of me, and you've been pissed off at me through this whole book. <laughs> it's like God votes for the guy in stage three. I mean, it's an amazing book to be in the Bible. And then you get to the prophets like Isaiah and Micah who have the, and Hosea who have these transcendent visions, and Jesus comes along. And in some ways, that stage four vision just flourishes, you know. So uh, traditions eventually need all four of those stages somewhere. And how the institution holds it, I don't know. I, I, and I don't even think that's within any of our power uh, but what we can do is to say, maybe here's, I, I, what I'm about to say might be a heresy in some settings, but I think it's a reality. And that is, can I say it this way? I don't care that there's, I, I love Pope Francis. I think Pope Francis is like the dream Pope in so many ways. I, I think his document, Laudato Si, is the most important religious document in the last 500 years. That means it's more important than anything Protestant ever written, in my opinion, uh, even though I'm Protestant. Um, but look, Pope Francis doesn't control the Catholic Church. <laughs> uh, and all the bishops are fighting with each other. Uh, Catholicism is not owned by an institution. It's bigger than that. And that seems to be true of every tradition. And so this is why, again, my friend Richard Rohr often says that dynamism and creativity happen on the edge of the inside. And, um, and that's where I think we can experiment with those stage four faith communities. And wouldn't you all agree that's probably a big part of what's happening at this very second, yeah. Hey. We're going to end right there. Brian, we're so grateful for you. Thank you so much for being here with us. 
Let's give Brian one more round of applause for all of the conversation, not just today. Really, thank you. Okay, thanks so much as always for listening, and we really hope that you enjoyed that presentation from Brian McLaren. And as always, if Faith Matters content is resonating with you and you get a chance, we'd love for you to leave a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or whatever platform you listen on. It really helps get the word out about Faith Matters, and we really appreciate the support. Thanks again for listening, and as always, you can check out more at faithmatters.org.